Hey guys, welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about getting the most out of your home theater system. Now I think most people are in my situation as far as the system and the room. I don't mean you have exactly the components I have. I mean you're in a big compromise. You know, most people, they're just watching the content. My wife does not care one iota about any of this. She is paying attention to what's being said in her shows. She does not care whatsoever about how it sounds. I'm kind of the opposite. I think most of you probably are too. I know I have some movies that really suck, but they sound great, so I own them. Like the new Godzilla. Terrible movie. I will never watch it again from start to finish, but there are certain scenes that are demo worthy. So I have it. <laughs> The room is a big compromise in that it's not a dedicated home theater room. You know, there's a step up from those people that are just watching content to those that are really enthusiastic about the hobby. That's me. I'm not in the industry. I'm not any kind of professional that has experience with lots of different equipment. That would be awesome, but it's just not in the cards for what I like to do. But I am very enthusiastic about not only sound in general, and I've been into loving audio, starting with two channel, since I was a kid. So this is just the evolution of where things are today. Home theater, home movie production, and we have this awesome selection of equipment these days. So I'm just doing what I can afford and what works for me. And what works for me in this room evolves over time as new things come out, as budgets increase, as I resign myself to having to spend those kinds of budgets to get what I want. And you know what? Sometimes that's hearing somebody else's system or a new feature coming out. And you know what? You just decide if it's worth it or not to you. And I think most people are in those shoes. And I also think most people like me have a less than ideal room. And that is what today's video is about. So Stepping up from enthusiasts like me, you have people that are lucky enough to be able to have a dedicated theater room, one that's designed properly, something that's rectangular, something with a lot of space so that you can put not only good equipment in, but put it in properly, which is so important. I have been fighting so many problems here in this setup just because of the room. If I was to take this exact equipment and put it into a dedicated rectangular theater room, I know it would sound a hell of a lot better, but I have to work with what I have. This is the only space in the entire house that is suitable. I do have a couple smaller bedrooms that I could convert, but it would be near field. I mean, I'm talking just a few feet between me and the screen and really one seat in the entire room. And even then, it would be too small for excellent bass. You need a large room for excellent bass in order to do it easily. So, that's what I'm working with. My room here is a decent volume, which is kind of a blessing and a curse because I need a lot of bass pressure in the room to give me what I need but it's also a completely weird shape. I have it half open here with a long hallway to the front of the house and the kitchen pass through. I have hallway and bedroom back here to the guest bedrooms and master. I have a large triple sliding glass door, which I do have a heavy curtain over. And luckily that's six feet off to the side. And with that side being open, that's one good thing about this room is I really have no side reflections. And that allows, especially in two channel stereo, for a vast, wide soundstage, effortlessly. So I really do like having the width. Downside is this room is set up 90 degrees off from where it should be. If you're setting up in a rectangular room, you really want to do it lengthwise. I don't have that option here. One side is, is all glass door out to the back, and one side is hallway and kitchen. So I have nowhere to put a TV or mains or anything like that on those two walls. So I'm stuck going this way, which is the short end of the room. So I have about 12 feet between my listening position and the mains and the TV, also affected by a fireplace right under the TV that sticks out uh, about a foot and a half. So that's eating up some depth in the room. Anyway, what we're gonna do today is get the most 
out of the system and the room. And I'm gonna talk about some things that you can do to get the most out of your system. I guarantee if you haven't done these things, you're leaving some performance on the table. And some of it is free. Some of it you can alter with what you already have. There is going to be some cost really to most of what I'm gonna talk about, but it's not that much unless you get to the last step, which is adding equipment. Uh, I'm going to be using REW and I'm going to be taking a lot of measurements. I'm going to talk about what I did and I'm going to show you what effect it has. And I'm going to talk about some common problems that you can look for and hopefully solve for yourself. Let's get going. Are you sleepy now? Now that you've been a puppy terror? <laughs> Are you sleepy now? Are you a tired puppy now? You know? Are you sleepy? Go say hi. Mm -hmm. So I've already done a video on basic speaker placement as far as the mains and subwoofer. So if you haven't watched that, I'll put a link down below. Go and watch that before you go any further. I've also done a walkthrough on how to use REW to take measurements. Again, if you haven't watched that, I'll put a link down below. Watch that. That'll bring you to where we are today. Now, the first thing we need to do is go through and set the basic parameters on our receiver. I'm starting all my crossovers at 80 hertz. And spoiler alert, this is actually where I ended up after testing. But I will show you what happens when you go up or down, especially with the mains. You need to make sure that the receiver is set in a straightforward mode. You don't want DSP processing on, you don't want uh, surround IQ, anything like that that's gonna alter the sound other than the basic room correction that the receiver has for setting levels and distance and delay and things like that. That's okay, but we don't wanna add any processing to taking the measurements. If after you get the measurements done and everything set up, you then want to go ahead and throw on a loudness curve, uh, you know, whatever DSP effects you like, that's fine. That's all personal taste. But for measurements, we need a nice level playing ground. Okay, so starting off here, we want to do the room correction and then throw out whatever your receiver says for speaker configuration, set everything to small so that we can use bass management. What this video is going to concentrate on is integrating the bass between our mains and the sub, which is really what room placement and a lot of room treatment helps with. So let's get going. So here I'm using REW to set the baseline loudness of the system. Now remember, you have to have your receiver with no processing. So whatever yours is called to just put through two channel or pass through or straight, whatever that is called on yours, set it to that. Make sure it's not doing any kind of surround processing. So you shouldn't have any of this noise coming through your center or surround channels, just your mains and or sub. So we want to adjust our volume level to 75. And when I stop talking, it'll show that. Close enough. So we are at negative 41 on this. So that's my reference level for these tests. So for this first test, I'm gonna set the fronts to large, which means it's not gonna do any base management. It's not gonna pass through anything to the sub. So these sweeps are now only going to play through the main speakers. Let's see what they're giving us all on their own. All SPL, let's go to, you know what, I like 1 12th smoothing. It helps show problems that 1 6 can really gloss over. Okay, so here's our strictly mains curve. Let's go full spectrum, 20 to 20,000 hertz. It's not terrible. I can tell you that most of this inconsistency, most of these peaks and valleys are simply the room. You know, it's for the most part untreated. I do have three large panels on the back wall that are only two inch thick. So it's not really doing much for the low frequencies. It really just helped reverb and echo. But overall, if you do look at it with a little bit more smoothing, the overall curve is very pleasant. It's a slight smiley face. You got a slight uptick in the highs 
and a slight uptick in the lows. And it's not terrible for ultra low base. You certainly still need a subwoofer, but it's solid down to 30. Below there, it certainly starts tapering off. But these do have very nice bass. But like I said, you still certainly need subwoofers, especially for home theater. All right, so we're going to call that just our mains. And this tells me that, you know what, I don't have really any big room correction to do. Not that there'd be a whole lot to do because setting the speakers, your main speakers, is more about your image than correcting for bass. But we, we see two suck outs here, two nulls here. One at about 47 hertz or maybe 50 and one around 90 hertz. So this is just from where the microphone is at the listening position and my seat is in the reclined position exactly as I listen and where the speakers need to be in the room. So there's not too much that I'm going to be able to do about this 90. The sub is going to be crossed over probably yours too, around 80. And there is going to be some overlap, a little above and below that where the crossover point is. So this 90 may be helped a little bit. The one down here, I'm not worried about at all. The sub is going to easily correct for that. And if not, there are some other things we can do, but pretty much from the upper mid base down to the sub base, we're going to get this a lot more straightened out. So let's go ahead and do that by just turning on the sub and doing another measurement. So we're going to go back and set the mains back to small. So we basically just turn on the sub again. And that will allow everything to play through as it's supposed to. Okay, let's try that again. All right, let's turn the smoothing back on. I want to do one twelfth on that main also. Okay, so here's our overlay. And we can see that it's not too different. It's really not too different. The base is not turned up. I am at negative 14 on the sub and zero on the receiver. So I have lots more headroom to go. And I certainly do dial that up. But for measurements, I want to try and get it even first and then dial it up to taste. So what we can see here, I'm going to turn off the mains. We have definitely more extension going down into sub base, but we got some suck outs here too. And we still have one near 50. That one I'm concerned about because that is the punchy in your chest base. And we still have this one around 90. So let's go ahead and see what happens if we turn the crossover up to 90 and just see how the chart responds. Now you may not want to keep it that way and spoiler alert again, I don't because I don't like the way it sounds. I think it has a little bit too much localization and the bass, especially after I turn the sub levels up, doesn't sound that great. It just doesn't sound as clean. So let's go ahead and do a measurement. I'm going to rename this real quick with sub 80. We'll do a measurement here with it at 90. Okay, so the blue line is crossed over at 90. Turn on smoothing. I swear there was a command to default smoothing and not have to do this every time you do a run. Maybe not. All right, so interestingly, we have more bass coming in down here, down low. Now that may be a run to run error, so I'm gonna run another measurement. Mm -hmm. 
smoothing again. And just for the purposes of this video, I'm only doing single runs, but when I'm actually measuring, I do a whole bunch and then hit this button down here, average the responses. And that gives you a much more accurate result because stuff does happen run to run. These two are more in line than this green one. So I would do a few more and see what happens. I'm confident that they're gonna look more like these two up here. And the green one was the anomaly because changing the crossover doesn't change anything down here uh, between 20 and 30 hertz. So we are getting significantly more bass down there. But up here is what I was concerned about. We bumped the crossover from 80 to 90 and really nothing happened. I mean, this is just uh, probably measurement error, you know. There was no shift. This dip here at 90 didn't go away. So that tells us that we can't correct it just by changing the crossover. What we would need to do is change the position in the room of the speakers or the listening position. And unfortunately, I can't do that. My listening position is the only place in the room that's acceptable. And the speakers have to be where they are due to equipment in the room and the great image. I'm not sacrificing the perfect image I have for this little bit of a suck out. Now, as far as volume difference, we're at 62. This is probably an average somewhere around here to 71. So, I mean, it's almost a 10 dB difference. I don't like it, but there's not much I can do about that. That's just the characteristics of the speakers, the position and the room. So let's concentrate on the sub. We still have this big dip here at 50. And I do want to take care of that. That is very noticeable, especially when you turn things up. So we're somewhere around 66 and the base average is somewhere around here, 70. So again, about a 10 dB difference. And that's a 100% volume level. That's twice the volume between these two points. And especially in the 50 Hertz range between 40 and 60 here, that is critical. That is the thump in your chest range. 90 to 100, that's more like the lower range of a male voice. Not super concerned about that as I am this, because this is visceral. And this is pretty much the only thing I'm missing right now in spades on my system. Low end extension, that's great. I mean, this is going comfortably down into the upper teens. And this is in regular mode. I tried extended, which does extend this a little bit, but it does cut the rest of the base. And I'd rather have everything else up here and fairly high with, you know, high teens. That's totally fine. Not too many movies use teens for response anyway. Okay, so we'll keep this one. This was sub at 90. We're gonna go back to 80. And just because I already know, after you get all this done, play stuff, play music, especially play movies. And go into this screen here and change your crossovers and just listen to what it does. I actually like the sound of it down at 60. It takes out some of the artificial boominess that some instruments can have, but for movies, 80 sounds a lot more natural. And I, I listen to a lot more movies than music. But, you know, you could cross it over both ways. But let's do 60, and I'll take a measurement here and show you what it does to the graph. And we'll see why 80 worked out better. Because the last time I did it, I had a bigger suck out. Okay, so this one was a sub at 60, dark green. Turn off at 90. All right, so this highlighted one here, you can see that right around 60 to 70 hertz is where it's relying on the mains instead of the sub and the mains have this huge suck out right here around 70 and that is very very audible especially when it's right next door to another big suck out at 50. so 
I don't like the crossover set here because it introduces this. Now let's go up to 100 and see what happens to this dip at 90. Can't hurt, right? I know already I don't like the sound of it at all, but we're going to show you what happens. Got the wife outside with the dog trying to uh, start potty training. <laughs> okay, smoothing and don't worry, I have it completely quiet, turn the AC off and everything when I'm doing actual measuring. This is just for the video. Normally I wouldn't be doing it while they're talking or anything like that. All right, so let's turn off 80 and you can see the difference here, the blue Completely obliterates the suck out between 60 and 70. Still leaves it at 90. And that's because this is due to the room. You cannot EQ this out. You cannot cross this out. It is simply the position of the listening position and the speakers and nothing but moving those around one or both of those will fix it. So I'm just going to have to live with that. I, I guess a whole lot of room correction material could, but this is not a recording studio. It's never going to happen. So let's put it back at 80 and see what we can do. Oh, you know what? I haven't actually shown you what the sub response really looks like. I have the uh, correction inside the subwoofer on right now. So I can show you why I did that. So here's the sub at 80. Hang on a second here. Let's put that back. And what I'll do is turn off the parametric EQ I've got in the sub. So it's just a normal response. And I'll show you why I have that on. Because it did dramatically smooth it out, except for that null, which it doesn't have any effect on. Okay, back down to 80 you go. Okay. So now, let me grab my iPad here. My sub is a SVS PB4000, and it has a built-in three-band parametric EQ, which is so important. And unless you have a sub with a built-in EQ or a mini DSP inline EQ or your receiver is somehow super powerful with one. My receiver here does have a four band parametric EQ on the sub, but it doesn't do a whole lot, not compared to the one built into the sub. All right, so here's another measurement. This is with the EQ off. And you can see we've got pretty good gain going on down here uh, between the upper teens and mid 20s really all the way to 40. You got this big almost table plateau peak and it's partially from the room it's partially from the sub and it's just partially from how the again positions are relative to each other. Didn't do anything for this null here you cannot EQ out a null like this don't add power don't add a bump you're just going to be wasting power. However much you throw at it, it's mirrored right back and it cancels itself out. So EQ to bring things down only, never to bring things up. So you can see why I brought that down and I'm going to, uh, I can't remember if this was the one, I need to do a couple more passes here because that one was the anomaly. Let me turn that back on, get another baseline, just so I can show you how it flattened out. And again, this is why I do multiple runs, just to make sure that you're not correcting for something that isn't there. Oh, you know what? Wrong screen. I needed to go into the sub and turn the EQ back on.
Okay, smooth this out a little bit. And you can see it brought these down. You know what? I'm going to bump that one I have at 20 up just a bit. So let's test again. And let's see how this looks. Smooth that out. Okay. I like that a little better. We can turn that one off. So I wouldn't mind a little bit more boost in the low end. Right now it's flat and I like a slight up curve. So you know what? Let's go down to that 20 and turn it off. So now I've just got one active EQ at 35. Let's see how that looks. Add some smoothing. Okay. You know what? I like that one the best. So we are going to stick there. All I've got then is pulling down at 35 just to kind of level this out. I got a little bit of a null right about 26 hertz and we've still got this big one at 50 and that is the room. So what do we do about that? We have to correct that. We really should correct that. We definitely want to correct that. Uh, I know that I've moved the sub all around and in order to get it as flat as it is, it has to be where it is. That's the best position in the room. This is being caused by reflections. It's caused by waves going through the room, one wave hitting the mic from the speaker, from the sub, and then at least one more from another wall, the floor, the ceiling, side walls, back wall, whatever, and they're canceling each other out. That's why no amount of EQ or adding power will help this dip because it's killing itself. We can change the listing position, moving the couch. I know changes this, but it introduces other problems. So this is my best case scenario. This suck here at 50 and this suck here around 90. So we can add a lot of room correction. It would take several base traps, several four to six inch thick base traps in order to kill that reflection. And then you would only hear the main speaker playing. That's not an option. Uh, I would love to, but it's not a dedicated theater room. It's a living room and that's just not an option aesthetically. So that's out. The next thing you can do is you remember how the graph changed when we added the sub to the mains? Well, we add another sub. Let's do that. My main sub is a SVS PB4000. I do not have room for another one of those. It's always best to add multi subs and keep them all the same. That's not an option because I don't have place in the room. I don't have space here on the other side. And in the corner here, this is where I tried it first. It excites the hell out of this wall. The cables inside it, everything hanging on both sides does not work and it's very localized. But I've got room for a PC 4000, same driver, same amp, same response, same everything, just in a vertical cylinder. You can see it's quite tall, taller than my mains. Well, there's probably some packing in there, but I would imagine it comes up to about here. And it pairs completely fine with a PB 4000. So this will give me flexibility to go dual sub, but put it in a place that's different than that. And that's important. If you're going dual sub to eliminate things like that, it needs to be in a different type of position. So in my room, because I have this fireplace and everything in the, it's not a symmetrical room, putting over there works. But if you've got a rectangular room, sometimes putting them like say on either side of your center stand or whatever, may not work because they may be acting the same. So you may have to put it on a sidewall or a back corner or back wall 
or wherever. I've got all this space here to try and I've got some space there just on the other side of the tower. So I think that we can get this integrated. I'm going to go and unbox it. I've got another SVS wireless kit with it. That's how I run the PB4000. It already comes with the isolation feet, so it's good to go. Let's set it up. So adding the second sub in this first position, I've went ahead and done the entire room correction again because I added the second sub. Every time you shift major positions, you have to do that. Um, you can test and move it, you know, a foot or two wherever you set it without having to rerun the room correction just to see what it will do. But if you do find a better spot, you then have to go back and rerun it again. Um, I'm not super happy with this result. The purple was just the single sub and the red is our dual. Now we can see that it did completely take care of that null at 50. So goal number one was achieved, but we actually have a decrease in the lower registers and we still have this null at about 25. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is play around with the phase and see if anything changes. So I'm gonna flip it to 180 and then I'll try 90 and we'll just see what happens. Oh, and just another thing, I can already tell I'm probably not gonna keep it exactly where it is. Just during the room correction, I can tell there's a big tonal difference between the subs. There isn't supposed to be. I mean, it's the same sub, same response and all that. But the new sub sounds higher pitched just uh, on the test tones, you know, the boop, boop, that kind of thing, it's missing the lower registers. So this kind of tells me, and it, that's definitely not a phase issue because it plays them one at a time. So I'm gonna see what phase does here, but I'm definitely going to be moving it to at least a couple different positions and retesting. All right, so let's go into the SVS app, connect to the new sub. It is a very cool app, lets you connect to multi-subs. Okay, I've got both sub volumes at negative 10 dB. Again, that's for the uh, room correction runs. You need to have those at a nice level setting. So let's go into phase, set it to 180, and do a quick test. Okay, let's see how this came out. Now we're comparing blue to red. Not much of a change there. I would say that's just test run accuracy. Okay, so it is definitely just the position of the sub. I'm gonna move it all the way back in the corner now, about a foot to the right, and we'll see what that does. And I'm gonna put the phase back to zero. So now we're corner loaded. I'm not worried about how it looks or anything. We're just going for basic placement. Let's retest. Okay, so the orange here is the corner loaded. Not really any change that I'm seeing. Still have this cancellation, about 25. And uh, it was kind of there with just a single sub wasn't quite as pronounced. I'm worried about the overall level though. We're down quite a bit below 40. And it's just taking a nosedive. I'm not really sure why. Let me double check my sub levels on the original. Pretty sure I had that set at the same level. Let's see. Mean volume of the new one negative 10 and negative 10. Okay, yeah, so it is the way they're interacting. That's very strange. Okay, let's move the sub, do room correction again, and retest. So now with the sub over here, just temporarily wired in. Obviously, if this works out, I'm not gonna need the wireless kit, and I'll just run a short sub cable in. 
But uh, this is pretty much the only spot over here. I'll, I'll probably have to move it over just a little bit because I don't want to crowd the door at all. Oh, I guess that's not... No, that's fine. That's fine right there. That leaves enough room for back of the speaker. And I've got just enough room to the wall there. Now this is a down firing 13 and a half inch driver. I don't know why they did this stupid speaker grill cloth on the outside. This is so fragile and so easy to snag. They should have just made this black ash like, you know, normal veneer. And then this is actually a cap that pops off and it is very easily damaged also. It's the piano gloss. I would have liked the normal ash wood on this also. And the three ports are right under here that you can put the foam plugs in. The same as that are on the front of the PB4000. Okay, let's go ahead and measure this. I just did room correction setting up for the sub over here. All right, so just to recap, these are just the main speakers. This was adding the one subwoofer, and this was adding the second to the first position. So we can see a definite line of improvement. We smoothed out the higher end base with uh, some detrimental effects in the lower end. So that's what we're looking to improve upon. We'll leave that up, do a measurement in position two. Okay, that looks a little better already. Let's smooth that out. We kept the nice fix up in the upper base. The red line is our new one. I'm sorry, the, what color is that? Brown line is our new one. They're really close to each other. There we go, I highlighted it for you. And we got our low base back. So something was canceling out in that extreme low register with it back in that corner and the first one up front. But with both of them up front, they are now working in tandem and that looks really nice. Now let's compare it to just the single sub. We can get rid of that. We're not going to that again. So here is just a single sub. And you can see that very nicely we filled in those nulls. This one right here is gone and all of this is gone. Actually, I actually have a little bit of a peak going on that we can EQ out should we need to, and I think we do need to. I think right there about 58, 59, 59. If we bring that down, maybe just 4 dB, that should do it. Now, the question is, which sub do we EQ? That is the question. Let's try EQing the new one and just pulling 59 down in the parametric EQ, just going into the SVS app here. So I'm going to turn on the first one and what was that at? 59 hertz. So we'll go to 50. Ah, man, that is hard to select. 58. That's all I can select. There we go. 59. You can use the arrows and we're going to cut it by, we'll say four decibels, and I want a real tight Q factor, because that's, uh, that's not too much of a spread. We'll just try a Q of five to start. That's fairly narrow. Okay, now let's retest. Move that out. Okay, let's compare just those last two runs. That's interesting. Why am I getting that boost in the low end? I didn't change anything about levels. All I did was pull 59 down, which definitely came down. That 
peak we had right there is gone. Hmm. Let me do another test. This is why I do multiples when I'm actually measuring. That is very interesting. You know what? Let me turn off that parametric EQ that I just added to another test. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, this should illustrate exactly why you do multiple runs. That first one was the fluke. So the levels are actually higher. Very interesting. Let's go ahead and get rid of that first one and average these. There we go. So now we got the new average. We can delete the individuals. Okay, so this is what we're working with right now. Still have a null at 50. Where is that coming from? That is 72 to about 80. Hmm. I'm going to keep working at it. So here's our final results. What you're looking at is both subwoofers, both set on zero phase in the ideal positions with the parametric EQ optimizing sub number one to bring down those two big peaks. Uh, sub number two did not need any correction and it's looking pretty darn good. Now, what I did was go through the phase, just adjusting sub one and going in 10 degree increments. What I found was that 70 degrees gave us an even better curve and really helped up here flattened things out and helped with this null right around the crossover. So this is helping where we're getting the crossover between the sub base and the mains. So this chart looks pretty darn good. And if we compare it to just the single sub that we started with, let me highlight. So the highlighted line is what we started with a lot more variation, a lot more variation. That is for sure. Don't worry about the levels. We're not comparing that. I'm just looking at, I mean, we are up a little bit. Hey now, <laughs> trying to work here. We are up a little bit and that's just from adding another sub. So that's to be expected. So whatever this works out to, it's not much. 77 to 81, so about a 4 dB, somewhere around there. Okay, not too shabby. So final thoughts, well worth it, especially for music. Now what I'm shocked about are a couple things that I wasn't counting on. First, what I expected was a little more bass and we did get that. Nothing dramatic, it's not double the volume or anything like that, but it is noticeable. It is a few dB up just from the added pressure. That's a welcome change. Got rid of those nulls. It is definitely noticeable, but only after you do it. It's one of those things where you don't know what you had until it's gone or the opposite in this case. It's kind of hard to describe, but there have been a few songs, uh, especially like Daft Punk, End of Line. It's got, I use that as a, a good test track because it has very deep extension, high bass, mid bass, low bass, all at the same time bass, multiple beats going on. And this leads me to one thing that I didn't expect. Now I've got both these subs, both these 4000 series in regular mode, not extended or sealed. Everything got tighter. The transients got very tight, almost like a sealed sub. And I can hear it in everything, but especially 
Who did this one? Uh, it's called Wagon Wheels by Jimmy Lee Robinson. And for the first time ever, the plucking of his guitar strings was pressurizing my ears. Like, like somebody's in here pushing on my head. It's not like, you know, overpowered, but the sensation is there. Never had that before. I would hear the sound and I would hear the beats and it was clean, but it's more visceral. Everything is more visceral. Combined with the fact that the transients are so much quicker now, I'm hearing more in songs. For example, end of line. If you're listening to it and you're hearing those two low end beats that are going at the same time, doon, 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 doon. That's the main one. There's an undertone beat. And I, until now I would hear it, but that's it. You can hear every single note and feel them in that sub beat now. You feel it, every note hitting, that second beat going. It's really weird. Anything with string bass, any jazz with string bass especially, wow. That's where I hear those nulls gone because string basses are very good at playing the entire range of your sub. And you notice when you have a dip because the notes will be going up or they'll be going down and you'll notice a volume dip. And you might think it was part of the song until you don't have that null anymore. And now that I don't, I can hear everything so much more evenly. It's very cool. Well worth it. Uh, whatever you've got, if you can go multi-sub, I definitely recommend it. I knew I wanted to at some point but I wanted to fully explore what I had at every given step and work my way up. It's not something you need to do right away, but boy, does it pay off, let me tell you. So there you go, hope this helps somebody get the most out of your system. We'll see you next time.